Welcome everyone. We're here for a very happy occasion, a new Monica McInerney book. It's been a long time we've been waiting for this one, so it's more auspicious than ever. Now, Monica's early life sounds like something out of her story itself. She grew up one of seven children in the Clare Valley in South Australia, and her dad was a station master. Her mum worked at the local library. But from then on, life got rather real. Monica had to work for a living, and she's done everything from working in the music industry to hospitality work, including waitressing and hotel cleaning. But these days, when she visits a hotel, it's there to either stay or to write about it, as she does. There's a gorgeous boutique hotel in The Godmothers. But let's start off by welcoming Monica and finding just a little bit more about her first. Hello, Monica. Hello, Mary Lou, it's great to talk to you again. Good to have you here. Now we have a very limited time. I'm just gonna start the timer so that we're all on the same page. <laughs> we'll talk quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so many questions and some great questions from our audience as well. So it's great. So first up, Monica, congratulations not only on your new novel, your 13th novel, but on 20 years in the publishing industry. Can you take us back 20 years ago to when you were first dabbling your toe in this world? How was it for you back then? I suppose in a funny way, I've actually been in the publishing industry for 30 years because for 10 years before I became a writer, I worked um, behind the scenes in publishing as a book publicist uh, in Australia and Ireland. So I uh, promoted and toured with authors like uh, Raoul Dahl and Tim Winton and Margaret Mahi and all sorts of amazing writers. Um, and then it was only after I left um, publishing and my husband and I had moved to Tasmania that um, I missed being around stories and talking about books and words all day. And um, I started writing short stories. And so I wrote um, probably dozens of short stories in uh, about two years, I think, sent them out hoping they'd get published. Back they all came, rejected. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was just loving the process of writing so much. I didn't mind the rejections. And then a beautiful thing happened in a space of about two weeks, um, three of my short stories got accepted and that gave me the confidence to start working on, on my first novel. And, uh, and that after two years of writing, that became uh, my first novel, A Taste Comedy. So, and that was published in 2000. So, so my lead in was, was short stories. It's uh, very interesting. We do have a couple of questions from our audience. So, how did you get started writing your first book? That's there. But another question in a similar vein is, did you attend many writers' workshops or belong to any writers' groups before you wrote your first book? Mary Lou, I didn't. And thanks to everybody for the great questions you all sent in. Thank you. Um, no, I didn't actually. And I was supposed to have gone to university to do an arts degree when I finished um, secondary school. And I actually deferred for a year. And in that year, I got a job um, as wardrobe girl on Here's Humphrey, the children's TV show. Um, <laughs> so I never did go back and do that arts degree either. Um, but I think I've learned how to write by being a reader. And, uh, and to this day, I still read two, sometimes three books a week when I'm on a really good run. Um, and I think you can learn everything you need to know about being a writer, um, if that's the way you want to go, is through reading. Because you can work out why am I interested in these characters? Why am I still turning the pages? So a library um, and, uh, and bookshops have been my, my university and writing courses, really. Let's talk about the inspiration for The Godmothers. So here we are, all these years later, your 13th book. So please give us a little snippet of what it's about. The story of The Godmothers, um, it is, all of my books are family comedy dramas is how I describe them because uh, I love to invent a fictional family. Um, um, I think every family is full of drama and every family is full of comedy. Um, but this is, in fact, uh, a family mystery in lots of ways. Um, I'm really intrigued personally by the secrets that one generation keeps from the next. Um, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. And I had two family stories that sowed the seeds for the godmothers. One of them um, is from my childhood. Um, one of my father's half-sisters, so an aunt of mine, died uh, in mysterious circumstances in 1957. And I grew up, um, this is before I was born, but I grew up hearing 
talk about that that aunt and and her her drowning death and I always thought there was more to it but no none of the adults would ever talk to me about it as you know if if, if it had been an accident or had it been something else and that stayed with me all my life that idea of who knew the real story of that more recently my um, my older sister uh, Mari turned 50 and her oldest friend gave her a collection of the emails and letters that the two of them had been exchanging in a really action-packed years of their lives in their 30s. They talk about their friends, their families, their relationships, apparently in forensic detail. And my sister has made her husband promise that if anything ever happens to her, the first thing he has to do is destroy that book yeah. because there's no way she wants her kids reading anything that, are, that is in that. And of course, her siblings. So I'm so intrigued, you know, I want to get my hands on that as well. But it's that idea of what do what one generation got up to or know um, that the other, the next one doesn't and for what reasons. Uh, and that was the starting point for, for the godmothers. And I wanted to write, um, I, I love writing about the different relationships within a family. I've written about husbands and wives and aunts and nieces and um, uh, brothers and sisters. And I was very interested in the godmother relationship because it's a chosen one. And in this book, um, Eliza, the main character, has two godmothers who were her mother, Jeannie's two best friends. And they know all the family secrets, uh, Olivia and Maxie, the two godmothers. And the book is really the mystery of, of Eliza trying to find out more about her mother's life, find out about the father she's never met. And is she being helped or hindered by her two godmothers? Uh, so that's, that's the path that leads you through the story. And a question from our audience is, did you have a favourite godmother? In, of the novel, in the novel or no, in real no, life? No, in no, your, in, your, in your real life. In real life, I had a godmother. My, um, <laughs> in fact, I never had a godfather. I mean, most people have godparents growing up. And um, in my, my six brothers and sisters all had a godmother and a godfather. And my godmother was another of my dad's sisters who was very religious. And mum and dad both felt, um, excuse me, being slightly flippant, but it was like two for the price of one because she was, you know, she, she could fulfil both roles really. And I think that's also why the idea of a godmother has really stayed with me because that's what I had. I didn't have a, you know, the book's not called The Godparents. Um, <laughs> and she was a very interesting character. She had grown up through the depression and she was diagnosed with polio as a 14 year old. And, um, and that had an enormous shaping um, influence on her life. Like she had to spend a year in a hospital for infectious diseases as a 14 year old. And her, her mum, uh, my grandmother would come down from the family farm to stand, like it would take a whole day to get down to the hospital, to just stand outside the hospital and wave at her little daughter in the hospital. And so scenes through the pandemic have really reminded me of, you know, of, of how difficult that was. But, um, but I think, as I said, I think my own godmother was shaped by that kind of difficult upbringing. And she, you could never get any real insights into what she thought about things. She was very good at evasive answers, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, and I think that's led to this as well, you know, the whole idea of a, a secretive godmother. Um, so she, sadly she died in 2008, but, um, but I'm, I'm enjoying talking about her a lot and remembering through the, the process of this book. Let's talk about Eliza. She's in a very organised, or she's a very, very highly organised woman. She's, she's the... God child, um, but she sets off, she's called by her godmothers, she sets off to the UK and she ends up living in this amazing hotel. Now I'm wondering, is this hotel inspired, oh, which one of her godmothers, Olivia, is running? It's filled with art, it's absolutely gorgeous. Was this hotel inspired by a real hotel? It's little elements of um, lots of hotels that I've visited, got to go and have a drink in or stayed in or, you know, just explored um, when I've been on a research trip, to be honest. Um, but I did, it's set in Edinburgh. Um, I, 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 Eliza lives in Melbourne at the beginning of the book and exactly as you said, she's because of this tragic event that's happened when she was a younger woman, she's turned her life into the, sm the smallest, safest, very lonely life. 
um, that she, you know, that she, she needed. Um, and then she's suddenly catapulted and finds herself in, in Edinburgh where Olivia runs this boutique hotel. And um, uh, I went to Edinburgh a few times for research trips and found an area called Haymarket. And there are quite a few hotels which have been um, established in, in the rows of beautiful terrace hotels, the terrace houses there. And, and Edinburgh is such a beautiful city for you know, long winding curving streets with these gorgeous um, sandstone buildings. So I walked around Edinburgh until I found the street that I thought yeah, that's where my that's where my hotel is going to be, and um, and stayed in one quite similar to in terms of it takes it took up three terrace houses, but uh, the day court everything else came out of my imagination, um, which was lovely. So because every day when I was going up to my attic to write, you know, I thought oh, I'm going to be in this gorgeous hotel, and and Eliza gets given the best room in the hotel. So you know, I was living vicariously Mary Lou for, <laughs> for a few months. I have a research photo I can show you if you like to oh, see yes, me yes so this yeah. is um so this is me in edinburgh uh in january uh and that's on a, one of the rows of terrace houses here's me peeking through there sorry but um um and that's the sort of setting for the montgomery hotel in the godmothers so that was in january um i had been there in april the year before in 2019 um, my husband and i went over to do the initial research and then I had this gorgeous trip in January with my 18-year-old Australian niece who was uh, visiting. And she came with me for three days. And we double-checked every single location in Edinburgh together, uh, carrying the manuscript with us. And, you know, I'd stand there and read out the, the scenes and the settings to make sure I had everything exactly right. So that's, um, so if anybody's reading the book, that's what the Montgomery Street looks like. Ah, that's fabulous. Thank you. And now the other thing is, the, it is a boutique hotel with a lot of art and art plays an important um, role in this book, just not as decoration, but there are a few plot points around it as well. So how did the art insinuate itself into the godmothers? Well, for me, I think, I mean, art plays a, a very important part in, in my life and in everybody's lives. I think we've all realised that through the, through the pandemic and lockdowns, that how much when life is tricky, you know, we all, we all find solace in in beautiful art or beautiful music or, you know, the literature, films, you know, things that involve our imagination that take us out of reality. And everybody in The Godmothers um, has has had loss of some sort or mm -hmm. has, have an ache for something that they had and is gone or something that they've never had and they'd long to have. And each of them have found solace uh, in, in different forms of art. Um, Olivia is the, um, Eliza's godmother in the Edinburgh Hotel. She had trained as an art historian and then met her Scottish husband. And so she has been in, put in charge of the, the collection that's, you know, the, the boutique hotel is quite famous for. Eliza herself is an amateur artist and, um, and through very difficult times in her life, she has turned to, to painting and to... The, the solace and the absorption of painting um, as, a, as a way to, to distract her mind. And other people use, um, without you know, spoilers, um, photography is used by another character um, and children's puzzles by another. So there's ways that, that art um, can take us out of ourselves and, and also join us with other people too, I think. It's a, it's, and, uh, and that happens throughout the story too. Mm. There, there is a particular painting that you write about in this book. So what's the significance of this one? Two of the characters, I probably won't go into too much detail yeah. again because um, the book's only been out a week and I'm not sure if people have had a chance to read it yet while they're watching. Um, but there's a painting that means an, a great deal to two characters and it's, um, uh, it's a painting that matters when younger years and more recent too. So I had a gorgeous day in London. I went into the Tate Gallery in London. Um, I hope everyone can hear the plane that's flying over um, or not hear it. No, uh, I went into right. the Tate Gallery uh, in London while I was researching the London scenes in The Godmothers and I walked in as one of the characters does um, and not knowing which painting I was looking for, but I was going to go into every gallery until I found one that almost that felt like it, it emotionally leapt off the wall at me. Mm. And this was going to be the painting that would matter to two of the characters. So to show and tell again, this is me at the um, in the Tate Gallery beside the painting that as soon as I walked into this room in the Tate, uh, I thought there is my painting. It's called Carnation Lily, Lily Rose. And it's by an uh, American artist called John Singer Sargent. And as you can see, it's enormous. 
um, like, you know, I'm, I'm five foot seven and that's, that's how it's towering over me. And um, it is the most glorious painting to look up, uh, look at in great detail. It's, it's in a spring garden and it's two little girls uh, lighting lanterns um, in preparation for, for a family party of some sort. And this is a recurring um, image through the book. Um, so if anybody's reading the book and wonders what that painting, you can Google it if you like, <laughs> but, um, but there's a sneak preview of it in the Tate Gallery. I got to admit, I did Google it. I had did no you? idea <laughs> it was that big. It's huge. It's <laughs> absolutely huge. <laughs> Now, you mentioned grief before, and it's something you and I have talked about um, during your tour for the, the trip of a lifetime. There was an element of grief in there, and certainly in the House of Memories, you explore the, the death of the child and grief there. So grief seems to, you know, be a, a recurring theme in your books. I'm wondering, is there something in the water in Dublin, or is it just that, that heart connecting, sometimes heart-wrenching, bittersweet melancholy that you're attracted to in some way? I think it's a great question, Mary Lou. I think I am shaped by grief. I'm shaped by grief and love as a human being, I think. Um, as we spoke earlier, I was very lucky to grow up as a middle child of a you know big, loving, noisy um, family of, of nine and seven, you know, seven kids. Um, and I started writing um, in 1999 when I was writing my first novel and my father died in um, March 2000. He'd been diagnosed with cancer and we knew he had a year to live. So I was writing my first book through that last year of his life. And when he died, um, I could not believe, one, how much it hurt and too much how much the whole world tilted for me, how, how a whole family changed shape, how everything that I had always felt sure of the security of knowing dad was there and and that the ground was solid under my feet it it tipped and that was a um a, a quite an extraordinary time in my life to realize what the you know and I've, I've read since that you know grief is the price we pay for love and that's what what i learned and i think because i've gone on to write family stories um and i think they are the the, the there's a lot of love and warmth and comedy in my novels but they all have a shadow side um, and it's often grief because the more I talked about people after my own experiences and very many subsequent griefs that I've been through because I'm 55 years old and no human gets through life without feeling, you know, lots of different sorts of pains and sorrows and losses of friends, personal losses, you know, things I would love to have happened that didn't happen and you have to, you know, come to terms with that. Um, and the more I talk to other people about, uh, being a human being and we all go through it we all go yeah. through that in different ways um, and this book is very much a book about um, being shaped by grief but not being um, wholly shaped by it by being affected by grief you can move through grief is an extraordinary emotion it's a very strong um, complicated emotion to for, for a novelist to write about I think and as is love you know because love can come in so many guises too but you can move through the different stages of grief. Um, and for me as a writer and as an observer of people, um, I find that very interesting, that it can have a very long lead time. Um, it, it can, some people will never recover from a loss. Some people find themselves a different sort of person because of it. And as I said, everybody in this novel um, is, uh, is mourning something or longing for something that they don't have. And that's, that's grief too, in a way, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Olivia's relationship with her husband, who's in a, in a nursing home. There's all kinds of layers going on in this book. It's beautiful and it's so wonderfully well written and heartfelt. Thank you. Thanks. Very much. There is a lot of humour in this book as well. Olivia's uh, mother-in-law living in this gorgeous hotel comes to mind. She is a piece of work and the scenes with her are just so over the top. It's just gorgeous. And then there's young Sullivan, who Eliza meets on the plane. Eliza has a fear of flying and uh, she's seated next to this. How old is he? He's, uh, as the book begins, he's seven weeks from turning 12. He's very specific right. about that. So he's 11, but about to turn 12. He's very specific about everything. Um, <laughs> and he loves to play Scrabble online. So I loved him even more. But I was wondering about him. I know that you've been very close to your um, nephews and nieces as they've, as they've grown up. 
Was he perhaps based on someone that you know? He's a little element of all sorts of things. Um, I have uh, a very good friend in uh, Dublin who's the son of, a, of one of my best friends and um, and she has a son who um, I have day trips out with sometimes. He and I will just go, you know, we've been to the zoo together or we'll have a day trip out in Dublin. And he has a fantastic vocabulary like Sullivan does in the, in the novel. I mean, Sullivan is not my friend, um, but I've greatly enjoyed the, um, the friendship of a 12 year old uh, or, you know, he's 10. So, you know, that kind of age group. And I've got, as I said, lots of nephews and, and I just find them so funny at that age because <laughs> they're on that cusp of, um, of being very earnest, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very particular too. Um, and so Sullivan was just a dream character to write. Um, and I loved it every time he, you know, stepped in, like he was only supposed to be on the plane um, that, that, as you mentioned, that, that Eliza is very scared of flying and he's, calms her down on the flight and um but I just had so much fun and he and Eliza were getting on so well that he becomes a major character <laughs> through the whole book um and that's one of the fun you know things about when you're writing because I don't plot beforehand I you know I know my group of people I know the, what I describe it as an emotional explosion that's going to happen to them um and that's going to set the plot up and running but beyond that I make it up literally as I'm going along you know through with the first draft it goes through many many drafts and edits but that very initial when the whole story is down for the first time uh, and so Sullivan was a surprise character for me but I just couldn't let him go and and Celine the, the evil mother-in-law was another one too um, I had to cut out um, I reckon probably 40,000 words of scenes with both of them because I was just having so much fun writing, but they didn't need, they actually weren't, you know, part of the plot. So I've got like a whole, you know, I could do novellas with each of them if I wanted. Oh, I'd love a Sullivan novella. Actually, I'd love a (laughs) Celine novella. They're both fabulous. It might happen. (laughs) (laughs) Now, uh, I think you might have had fun writing Maxie too. She's, She's the other godmother we haven't talked about yet. So, uh, she's, She's an actress and she's, she's lots of fun. She has that, that sense of, of drama and charisma that you expect in an actress. And she's also kind of childlike as well. So I'm wondering, um, if, how, did, how did you go about choosing, there's Olivia and then there's Maxie. I mean, they're not related, but um, I'm just wondering how you, you said you you have a cast of characters to begin with, but those two particular personalities, how do they evolve, evolve while you're writing? With the two of them, because I knew from the start that it was going to be about the godmother relationship, and um, and Eliza's mother Jeannie is um, is is, a, is quite a troubled um, woman, and and there's and there's scenes going back that you discover, you know, Jeannie is a younger woman, and um, and the friendship between um, Olivia and Maxie and Jeannie, they all went to a, quite a religious boarding school together um, and were kind of the bold girls, really. They were always a bit separate and you know, up to no good and that kind of thing. So they, they have a friendship that was very, very strongly forged at school. And I was also, that's another layer that runs through the book. It's about Eliza and you know, her, her pilgrimage, if you like, um, to about her, her father and her mother. But it's also the story of a friendship between three women over their lives. And um, and I wanted to write, like, Olivia, who's the one in the boutique hotel, is is quite, she's very, I'm sort of sitting differently now, I'm talking about her, but yes. she's, you know, she's very <laughs> controlled. She, she needs to be, you know, because she's she's become a stepmother as a young woman. She's now found herself running a hotel. Her much-loved husband has dementia and, you know, she's having to, to, to mourn his loss, even though he hasn't passed away. And Maxie was always the kind of, you know, now here I'm doing, I'm sitting differently now too. Um, Maxie was, it was always the dramatic type and, um, and you know, an actor and she's a successful actor. She's on a, on a, um, a drama series in the UK that's, you know, very, very popular and she's very well known. And, um, and I'm interested in the way that within a friendship, um, you make allowances for each other over the years um, but also how you find yourself falling back into those patterns like if Maxie as a young woman or Max is just being flighty or you know oh, that's just her being dramatic you can get away with a lot for the rest of your life like there's a few scenes where somebody needs to be the adult in you know in the situation and Maxie goes oh no I can't I'll just get too upset um, and she might not she's a 50 year old woman she should be able to cope with those situations but I'm really interested in um, when I'm writing my characters why they are like they are now and um and 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 how much you can get away with sometimes because of what people believe you to be 
So it's a, it's a story about that as well, about you know, your own self image, I suppose. Now, Maxi does take us to Gretna Green for a wedding. Now you've mentioned your research. It sounds as though it's totally meticulous if you're standing there with a, mat a man your manuscript and ticking everything off to be right. So I'm guessing I am, yeah. you went to Gretna Green. I did and, I, and I've got photographic proof. <laughs> Here I am with the sign in Gretna Green. Um, for people that don't know, Gretna Green's on the border of Scotland and England and it's, um, it's, it's historically famous for, cent you know, for, I think it's centuries, for um, being, yeah, since 1754 um, that people went there to elope. So um, lots of people in, in lots of books over the years have run off to Gretna Green to, to get married. And, um, and I wanted just char my, my characters to get to go there to get for, for a wedding. Um, and so John, my husband and I went there for a couple of nights and spent, and it's the most extraordinary thing. It's a wedding theme park, basically. I had no idea such a thing existed. And <laughs> There's a big hotel by it, um, which I haven't got the photo of here. But um, but you sit in the hotel and um, and there's just brides and grooms sitting at the next table because people go there for either big weddings or they want to just, you know, literally run away and have a really little quiet wedding. But there's a cottage there, a blacksmith cottage, and you organise to get, uh, you know, to have your ceremony. And then there's this anvil, this famous anvil at Gretna Green in this, in this um, blacksmith's cottage. And the moment that you announce that you're married, the um, the person conducting the the wedding hits the anvil, um, so the sound revolves around the the room, and that marks that you're officially married. So it's all these you know traditions and, and rituals there. So it was a fascinating place you know to to visit, um, and I was poking my nose into this door and that door and got asked to leave because I thought it was you know just a tour group being shown around one of the weddings, and in fact it was a real wedding, <laughs> and it's me like. <laughs> looking around so I had to kind of get out quickly but it, as I said it's such a theme park for example you can get Gretna Green tea towels which have every you know like all the different um, buildings involved and there's sculptures here and there and little arbors that you can stand under to you know have your wedding photos taken fascinating place um, I'm sure there's documentaries being made about it but um, no I, I loved having a look at that mm. That's fantastic. Another fantastic location in this book is a castle. Now, we can't talk too much about it because there's a plot twist and another plus. There are lots of twists in this book that will just keep you transfixed until right to the very end. So this castle involves one of those. So we're not going to talk about why we're going to look at a castle, but the writing of it was so evocative. I'd love to see it in real life, if I'm sure you've got a photo there of it too. I do. This is um, it's one of um, my favourite castles in Ireland, uh, and that's me standing in front of it on a very, very cold January day. And again, I would love to sort of talk a little bit more about it because it's got a fascinating history, um, but I can't. But if you read uh, The Godmothers, um, it's it's all in there. Um, but that again, it's one of the, you know, I, I take my location research really seriously. I try to... Uh, because I have lots of international settings in all of my books and and people visit so many places now that you know I, I know from emails and I get from readers which I always love to get um, they said oh, you know oh that you reminded me I went there two years ago and I want to make sure that I get it right um, so for me to actually spend physical time in everywhere that I describe so that's um, again if you're reading the, the godmothers and I, when I do start talking about that uh, so that's it from one angle and then um, in summertime so um, this is it. There's a beautiful river and um, and a bridge nearby. Where in the summertime, they grow these beautiful flower boxes. Wow. So this is the this, the castle towers over this this um, Irish town. Um, so yes, yeah, that, that, that is a, beautiful. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely lovely. I'm just having a look. We are running out of time. I knew I'd have too many questions. I've got pages <laughs> of questions, but let's have one from uh, one of our audience members. And this one is. It has been a few years between books. So the question is, how long did it take you to write this, The Godmothers? Um, I'll give the quick answer here. It took about 18 months. Um, I had worked on another book um, for two years before um, The Godmothers. And, uh, and when I finished writing 200,000 words of that book, I realised that I, that was one I'd needed to write, but it didn't need to be published. Wow. So that's why it's taken me this long for this book. That's why it's been three years between books for me. I had written another whole book, um, but for lots of different reasons. Sometimes books uh, you write and therefore lots of readers, sometimes you need to write 
practice when I'm talking about creativity before, sometimes you need to write purely to write. Uh, so I have a book on my laptop at, at, at home in Dublin that I'm the only person that's ever read it and that will always be the case. Um, so it, it took three years in terms of time for my last book, The Triple Lifetime, for The Godmothers. Uh, but the actual writing of this one, about 18 months. Um, and, uh, and I love the experience. It was, um, I thoroughly enjoyed all of the characters. There's a lot of, as I said, there's a lot of shadow and, and um, sorrow, but I also laughed a lot while I was writing it, which yeah. is always kind of a funny thing to say, because you know, I'm, I'm at home in my attic in Dublin writing and my husband can hear you know, me um, laughing away upstairs <laughs> in the attic. The mad woman <laughs> in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm giving it away. <laughs> so, um, well, actually, while we're it, on the theme of the mad woman in the attic, there have been... You said it, not me. <laughs> there have been a lot of questions about your writing process from our audience. And um, you're a very... In, by your own admission, Monica, you are a very superstitious writer. So I'm curious about your superstitions around your writing and what your workspace looks like. Um, and I can show you just everyone's, everyone wants one. To know. Sorry, Mary Lou, say that last one again. As yeah. is our audience, because everyone wants to know. No, that I'm yeah. very disciplined. That's the first thing to say. So I turn up every day at my desk. I'm, you know, I know that that's it's it's a lot about imagination, but it's also just absolutely discipline. You've got to writing is a muscle. You have to turn up every day and work at it. So I do that. But because your writing is in your head, I I develop with each of my books. Um, various rituals and I collect things with each book which become a real part of the writing process for me. For example, the House of Memories, the family and that are called the Foxes. And so I collected dozens of fox figures the whole way I was writing that. The um, Hello from the Gillespies, a robin, a little robin bird is in that. So I collected all these robins. So they were all on my desk. With the godmothers, and this isn't a spoiler, I can say this, um, Sullivan, the little fella that we were talking about, the 12-year-old, uh, 11-year-old, he has a bit of a fixation with ring-tailed lemurs, the gorgeous animal, and uh, I developed one as, as the book, and, um, and foxes were great when I was writing The House of Memories. As it turned out, you can get fox things everywhere. Ring-tailed lemurs, a little harder <laughs> to find, but I went to um, Dublin Zoo and Edinburgh Zoo. They had a great, you know, so when the there is a visit to Edinburgh Zoo. But this is my desk while I was writing oh. the Godmother. Wow. Others. So you still survived from when I wrote The House of Memories. And then I have nine little ring-tailed ring lemur <laughs> toys there. Um, I'm also working on a children's book, uh, which is being published next year, called Marcy Gill and the Caravan Park Cat, my oh. first book for younger read. It's for 10 and under. And I've started collecting <laughs> black cats too. Um, but I also got this habit, I have a thing about the number nine that I can only finish writing at the end of the day if my word count ends in nine. And, um, and so that became important. And there were nine of these little lemurs. And I couldn't send off the manuscript to, I save it into a cloud each day, into a, you know, like I email it to myself, unless I had touched each of the nine lemurs on the head and then the fox, and then the cat, and then this little golden goose that my sister gave me. So I develop all these rituals, and, and, um, and I, I understand, like, I'm not obsessive in my own personal life, but when I'm writing, I've realised that they're, they're kind of the little ways that I finish work for the day. Like, as a writer, and you know this, Mary Lou, absolutely, through your writing career too, that, that it's, it's not like you can clock off because it's still going on in your head even though you've finished at the end of the day. Um, and for me, I think my rituals of, you know, top, tapping everybody on, on the head, um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story and one of the many, many reasons we love you, Monica. Absolutely. So congratulations once again. 20 years in publishing and your 13th novel, The Godmothers, and we look forward to your children's book as well. Thank Not you. That'll be in um, yeah, April, April next year. And that's just been such a beautiful experience because um, it's a family story set in a caravan park, as I said, for 10 and under. Um, so it's got comedy and drama, but it's also got magic in it. Um, and the joy of being able to make things happen with magic. And also I'm working um, with this terrific illustrator uh, from South Australia called Danny Snell. Uh, and that's been such an amazing experience to watch him turn my characters into these gorgeous illustrations. Because obviously with, you know, with um, one of these, I don't, you know, they don't have illustrations, but my, my children book, my children's book will have. Um, so yeah, it's a lovely experience. It's been a lovely writing experience. And, and that will be the first in a series. So I'm working on the second and third books of those two. Wow. So. Yeah, busy. You are busy. Busy time. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Well, Monica, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a wonderful chat and a wonderful opportunity to find out more about your latest book, The Godmothers. So if you've read it already, you know how wonderful it is. If you haven't, we'll make sure you do. It's well worth it. It's just another gorgeous book from a fabulous, fabulous storyteller. Monica, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Mary Lou, and thanks so much for everybody at Queensland Libraries for hosting me too, and all of you for, for tuning in tonight. Thank you.